The next case to come before us this morning is City of Akron versus Murray Rome. Both sides will have 15 minutes to present oral argument. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you're the appellant wish to reserve any time for rebuttal, please let me know when you get started. I'm keeping track of the clock. You can also keep track of the clock on the wall over there if I do this machine correctly. Please don't use the names of any victims or minors as we are recording this oral argument and will be posted on the court's YouTube channel. We've read the briefs and we are ready to proceed in your life. Oh, great. Would you like to reserve any time for rebuttal, counsel? Uh, sure, maybe a little bit, five minutes. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning. I feel like I should have brought party favors. <laughs> you uh, said no. your goodbye last time. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Here I am again. Uh, yeah, here you are again. Just came your room again. Okay. Um, attorney uh, Dave Lowry for uh, Appellant Murray Rose. Uh, uh, this is a uh, it's a misdemeanor case, uh, um, but notwithstanding that fact, it's, it, it's, it has some interesting aspects to it. Uh, the uh, just is a, a brief. Uh, I guess description of, of what happened was there was a, a call went out uh, to 911 uh, relative to a disturbance in a neighborhood. Uh, the police ultimately responded and uh, they found my client uh, alone uh, outside on the sidewalk and essentially in front of his house, as it turns out, the place where he was living. Ultimately, he was arrested and charged with uh, resisting arrest, obstructing official business, and uh, disorderly conduct. Initially, the charge of disorderly conduct was, I think, under subsection A1. It was ultimately amended to A2, uh, either the day before or the day of trial. Uh, a visiting judge heard the case out of Akron Municipal Court, uh, and um, uh, subsequent to the, uh, the uh, case went to a jury. jury found uh, my client guilty on all charges, uh, and uh, we subsequently filed a timely appeal with this court and matter before the, the court. Um, the issues presented... Uh, I, I believe they're, they're relatively simple and they all re revolve around um, a motion in limine which was filed uh, by trial counsel. I was not trial counsel. But they all revol revolve around a motion in limine uh, and the, the sum and substance of the motion in limine was to preclude a portion of the uh, BWC or the body worn camera uh, that one of the officers was wearing at the time. Uh, specifically, <coughs> during uh, discussions with Mr. Rones, uh, Mr. Uh, there was a statement made by my client relative to the fact that uh, he had been in prison previously and had done prison time. Uh, the uh, ultimately, trial counsel did file a motion in limine to preclude that uh, on the basis of. Uh, evidentiary rules claiming obviously that uh, the perception was it was more pre uh, prejudicial and probative and it went to uh, a substantial right, constitutional right essentially to a free trial. Uh, the uh, uh, trial court judge uh, denied the motion uh, in limine <clears throat> but um, in, in the, the, I guess from my standpoint perhaps the court standpoint that the, the, this case and the arguments that are set forth by my client are uh, identifiable in really about five or ten pages of the transcript. Um, the uh, court had a hearing on the issue of the motion to suppress the motion in limine, and uh, Judge Perk was the, the trial court judge. And in the transcript, it, uh, Judge, at page 16, uh, line 6, he denied the uh, motion in limine. Uh, he also permitted that time the prosecutor to amend the complaint, which we talked about previously. But it's important that the judge said on at line six, he said, obviously part of the ruling of denying the motion in limine is that the parties don't make any additional issue of the statements that defendant made. But then he said, but I don't see how I can take them out under the circumstances they are today. So in his ruling, he says, look, it, you know, you, I'm not going to grant your motion in limine because there were some technical issues. If you read the, the, the entire transcript, actually redacting or pulling that portion out, based upon the exchanges at the time. But he clearly said, don't make any additional issues of the statements that are made. That's on page 16 of line 6. So the case so, went... I have a question. Yeah. He may have clearly said that, but was that clear? I can think of a lot 
lot of different ways that that second part of the motion could be interpreted. Don't talk about why you were in prison or you know, your prior conviction, the, the facts surrounding it. Was it really all that clear? Well, I, I, and I think that's what the, the state you know, ultimately uh, argues because the state, page 78, uh, line 23, you know, puts the officer up, you know, they, they qualify the, uh, the uh, issue, and, and the state, one of the first questions that they ask the officers, uh, it page, at line 23, okay, now we heard some portion there about Mr. Rhodes stating he had some, done some prior prison time. I mean, and then if, if you read that, the prosecutor goes, the prosecutor goes on at the time and sort of has, in my opinion, you know, a, a half-baked argument where he says, I think what you're alluding to, and that's at page 80, uh, line 5, the prosecutor says, then I misunderstood your ruling and thought I was permitted to discuss what was going to be heard as to how it, and there's that, that goes on, and the judge says, um, it was heard and that was it, we don't discuss it, but the judge clarified, I think, it wasn't, it, it certainly uh, uh, wasn't uh, I, I certainly wasn't a misunderstanding to Judge Burke at the time because on page 79 at, uh, uh, at uh, line 22, Judge Burke said, I told you not to discuss it, not to mention it. So, you know, what's in the transcript versus, you know, you, you, know, you got body language and everything else, you know, that, that, that kind of sends a message to people. I think it was clearly, I don't think there's any doubt that the trial court uh, understood his admonition to be that you, you, I told you not to discuss it, not to even mention it. So, you know, you, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that's what the prosecutor chimed in after they said it, but I, I think if you read the transcript, I think it's clear that, that the judge, uh, particularly because the, the, the issue was, if you go back and look, where they're talking about, you know, why it's prejudicial, why everything else, is the fact that the, the, the mere mention that he had done prison term, a prison time. I think that the judge's ruling where he says, don't talk about it, don't mention it, I, I think that's pretty clear that, that it was not to be mentioned and it was not to be discussed. And even if it was, the, the nature of the question, that uh, there was a portion that said that he had done some prior prison term, I think that cuts right through. Any, any vagueness that there may have been, I think that question circumvents any vagueness issue and goes right to the issue. You're told not to talk about the prison term, and you ask a question specifically about it. Um, and then as you go on, where, uh, you know, the prosecutor says, well, gee, I misunderstood the ruling. I don't think there's any possible means or method that anyone could misunderstand the fact that you're not supposed to talk about the fact that he mentioned that he was going to prison. So um, I, I think that it, when, you, when you take a look at the sum of substance, I guess my first issue is I think the motion in limine should have been granted. I think the court should have found a way to redact the, the relevant portions, and I think that there's no doubt in my mind that the um, material that was that the judge allowed allowed in was clearly more prejudicial than it was probative. I mean there was no probative aspect to it whatsoever. And then if, if you take a look at that, if you say, well that's not the case, okay, which is my assignment of error number one, and you move down the rung to assignment of error number two, my assignment of error number two is that um, there was prosecutorial misconduct. And that the court clearly admonished the prosecutor and said, don't talk about it. And the prosecutor comes out and asks a question to point on it. I mean, it was to point. Um, it, and, and based upon that, I think that's prosecut prosecutorial misconduct. And as I talked about in my issue number two, if you don't believe that, then, you know, the question is that, you know, my assignment error, error number three, as you go down the rung, is that, you know, the, the, the prosecutor or the uh, defense counsel made a, a proper and timely request for a mistrial, and the judge denied it. So, you know, I think if, if, that as you go down the rung, if you don't believe at the top, I think you, that, that there should have been a mistrial declared based upon the misconduct. I think it was egregious enough. I think there was uh, a substantial right effect, the right to a fair trial. Uh, there, the, the, that, that prison time would have never been come in. There was no way it should have come in other than the fact that uh, the, the judge let it in by denying the motion in limine. Well, counsel, uh, that just goes to uh, the point I was going to make. He, he made 
may have disobeyed the trial court's order, but at the same rate when you're talking about prejudice, how can you say it's prejudicial when the video itself, uh, the audio, I should say, talk, he talks about being in prison? And that was played in front of the jury, right? It was played for the jury. That's correct. So if, if we would rule that um, assignment of error one, the trial court did not err in allowing the motion, I mean, allowing, I should say, in denying the motion to eliminate and allowing the videotape in, doesn't that take care of your other two assignments of error? I think it does. Well, it, it, no, no, I'm saying if it does, if, the, if we say the trial court did not err in, in allowing the videotape in. Because the point is, if, the uh, jury I, here heard him say, I was in prison. Right, right, right. Correct. Um, I don't disagree necessarily with that statement. I think that if, 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 if the court disposes of um, the assignment of error number one in that manner, that may very well uh, address the other two issues, assignments of error. Okay. Um, Bill, you just now did that five minutes. You may continue. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, save that last five, just in case. OK, thank you. Okay. Your Honors, <coughs> excuse me, and may it please the court, my name is Mike Walsh. I represent Appley, the city of Akron, in this appeal. We ask that this court affirm in full the judgment of the Akron Municipal Court that came following the jury trial of Mr. Rose. There are three issues in this case, the evidentiary issues, the prosecutorial misconduct assignment of error, and then whether the trial court erred by denying the requested mistrial. We raised both substantive and procedural arguments against all three. My intent today is to focus on the substantive arguments. So first with the evidentiary issues, both below and in his briefing here, Mr. Rhodes has argued on two separate evidentiary grounds for exclusion, those being relevancy and 403 balancing. And both below and here, Mr. Rhodes has argued there was no probative value whatsoever, no relevancy whatsoever to his comments about his incarceration. And just from the start, that is not the case. Now, was the fact that Mr. Rhodes was previously incarcerated relevant to any of these charges? No. What was relevant, however, is why Mr. Rhodes brought it up. He brought up his prior incarceration to justify his actions. He was explaining to the officers that, and as seen as on body or camera, that I'm speaking loudly because when, I, when you're in a pod, when you're in jail, you're, I believe you mentioned 1,200 other inmates, you have to speak loudly. He used his incarceration as a justification for his actions. And this specifically goes to disorderly conduct, which the disorderly conduct ar uh, arrest underlies both the obstruction and the resisting. And under the Akron Codified Ordinances, upon which Mr. Rhodes was charged, you, uh, the state has to show that Mr. Rhodes knowingly was disorderly, or recklessly, rather, was disorderly. Okay, so the state had to show either recklessness, knowing, or purposeful mens rea. And certainly, Mr. Rhodes' own admission, his own party opponent's statement about why he was acting the way he was, is relevant to whether he was acting with the appropriate mens rea for the charge to stand. Well, but wouldn't that be a defense that he raised? Uh, could you clarify, Your Honor? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I can clarify or not, because I'm still it's all thinking through it. But I guess, I guess the point is, he was saying, here's the reason why I am um, screaming because I used to be in prison and I had to, to um, I had to speak at that volume, at that volume level. I guess my question is, is that something that would come in going to his mens rea, or would that come in more as um, a defense that he would raise? I think it could come in as both, Your Honor. And perhaps that's the irony of this case, is I think one of the strongest relevancies of this evidence is actually in Mr. Rhodes' defense. Mr. Rhodes, I believe, below could have argued that I, based on what he said in the video, I just got out of prison. At one point, does say he just got out. I've been there for 34, 35 years. And when you're incarcerated, this is how you have to act. And therefore, since I just got out, it's not reckless of me to be behaving the way that I have for the prior 35 years. 
now that I'm fresh out of the street. And so, so, and, and, and so that's what I guess I'm getting at. The state to prove recklessly um, would not have had to demonstrate that he was yelling loudly because he was in prison. They only had to prove that he was yelling and wouldn't cooperate with the police to stop yelling. So why should the prison factor even come into play is what I guess I'm asking. Sure, Your Honor. And the prison factor could also go to the flip side of the defense, mm -hmm. which would be Mr. Rones is telling the officers that I'm behaving right now the way that I did in prison. It's showing that he is aware that he is being loud, that he is being somewhat belligerent. And that would go to recklessness, if not knowing or purposeful. But the videotape itself would demonstrate him yelling and screaming and acting disorderly. Certainly, Your Honor. And that would also go to this, the city's harmless error argument, which is that even if this evidence did not come in, there is still sufficient evidence in the record, and certainly in the video, to show that Mr. Rose was behaving disorderly. It, it is the city's position that this evidence is relevant in either direction, either to help Mr. Rones in saying that he was not being reckless, that he was behaving as he, the only way he knows how for the prior 35 years, or that it shows that Mr. Rones was well aware that he was being loud, that he was being disorderly, and that the officers, therefore, had reason to arrest him, and the jury had reason to convict him. And whether or not this would is, is well, so if this is relevant, that's where the 403 argument comes in, which is that the evidence has to be substantially a more, or make substantially the probative value of the evidence has to be substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice, which is what's argued here. Unfair prejudice requiring that the evidence might result in an improper basis for the jury's decision. And in this case, the perhaps irony is that Mr. Rhodes made his incarceration an issue in the case by using his prior incarceration to justify his actions. So <clears throat> keep in mind, the jury does not know what Mr. Rhodes was incarcerated for. The jury does not know oh, anything about his incarceration other than the fact that he had been there and for the length of time that he said he was there. And so all the jury has is the fact that he was incarcerated, and while incarcerated, he behaved in this way. And that's not, if the jury even decided on that basis, that's not an unfair basis to decide the case upon, because Mr. Rhodes made his time in prison relevant to his actions outside. On the prosecutorial misconduct and mistrial issue, the city sees these as interlinked. The mistrial, the motion for a mistrial below was only raised off of the alleged improper question. So both the mistrial and the prosecutorial misconduct turn on the question that was discussed by opposing counsel. And it all gets back to exactly what Judge Callahan you brought up, the statement that obviously part of the ruling of denying the motion eliminates the parties don't make any additional issue of the statements that defendant made. And the fact that this does have multiple meanings. No, don't make any additional issue could be taken as Judge Burke took it to mean you can play in the video, but no more mention, nothing else. It can also be taken as, as uh, the prosecutor took it to mean that this is coming in, you can discuss what's in the video, but this discussion in, from the video does not open the door to discussion of, for example, what Mr. Rose was incarcerated for, as it would have had Mr. Rose gotten on the stand and explained that he was incarcerated. It, that might have opened the door to further discussion. But even aside from whether or not the, the question by the prosecutor was improper, there's absolutely no prejudice here. First, the, both this court and the Ohio Supreme Court have held that a appellant cannot sustain an assignment of error on a sustained error below. And that's exactly what Mr. Rose is trying to do here. Immediately after the prosecutor asked the alleged improper question, the defense counsel objected, and the trial court immediately sustained the objection. The witness at no time in this case was allowed to answer the prosecutor's question. So the system worked here. Judge Burke interpreted his motion to eliminate to be, as he did, that there's no further mention of it. And when the prosecutor ran afoul of that in Judge Burke's eyes, the defense counsel objected, and Judge Burke struck the question. Further, the trial court here granted a, a period of jury instructions. Now, there's certainly some oddities here with the jury instructions in the sense that the record has three different sets. It's the city's position that since the, rec the transcript that we have does not show which set of jury instructions was used, that the presumption of regularity in the absence of record means 
one of the three sets was used. And all three sets contain the same curative instructions, one being that statements by counsel are not considered evidence, the other being that statements that were stricken by the court are not considered evidence. And here, this statement falls under both. The only statement that Mr. Rhodes alleges constitutes prosecutorial misconduct, and the only statement that Mr. Rhodes alleges is justifies the mistrial was a statement by counsel, which the jury heard was not evidence, and was stricken by the court, which the jury was told not to consider. And as this court must presume that the jury followed its jury instructions, and to the point of prosecutorial misconduct, where the question is, could this court determine beyond a reasonable doubt that the jury would have found Mr. Rhodes guilty without considering the alleged misconduct, the answer is yes. Because this court already has to presume that the jury found Mr. Rhodes guilty without considering the alleged improper question. As for a mistrial, well, the mistrial assignment there here is barred by Ohio Supreme Court precedent. In State v. Sage, the Ohio Supreme Court held that a single improper but unanswered question does not amount to prosecutorial misconduct that would warrant the granting of a mistrial. That falls, this case falls directly within the four quarters of Sage. It was a single question that was asked but unanswered, immediately objected to, and the objection was sustained. Under State v. Sage, this court cannot find an abuse of discretion on the mistrial issue. And again, even if this court were to find an issue there, the prejudice was cured by the curative jury instructions. And if there are no further questions? Seeing none, thank you. Judge Callahan, congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. We will rest in our briefs. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, initially, with respect to the issue of the mens rea, I agree. It would have been a defense with your questioning on that issue. I think that that's, that quite frankly is not an issue before the court or even relevant, quite frankly, to justify what clearly to me is prosecutorial misconduct. I mean, I'm going to go back to page 78. I think it's the only page the court really needs to read. And if you read this, now this is after the judge tells the prosecutor, don't mention it. If you read this page and you start around line 13 or so, the prosecutor asks, were there any other issues from that point forward with the defendants? No. Do you recall any other conversations that you had with the defendant, why he is behaving, why he is behaving this way or anything like that? So right away, they're the prosecutor, even though they were told no, he's, the prosecutor's angling towards this issue of the prison time. And then the officer said there was a brief conversation in the car, but I was concentrating on issuing a citation and getting a report started. I was kind of listening, but not really. So in other words, the officer saying, the officer answered the question, end of story. The officer said, no, I don't know, you know, I don't know anything, you know, where you're going with this question. I don't, I've answered the question, the answer is no. Then the, and counsel couches this term as a question. This was not a question. The prosecutor said, okay, now we heard some portion there about Mr. Roan stating he had done some prison time. That's not a question, that's a statement. So it wasn't as if the prosecutor asked a question. The prosecutor made a statement at line 23, and interestingly, there's a question mark after it in the transcript, but I don't know why, but that is not a question. That's a statement. Well, counsel, but it's still not evidence, because the prosecutor, just because the prosecutor gets up and says something doesn't make it evidence. But I understand that, but he was, but it's a prosecutor asking a question to a police officer about saying in front of a jury that, okay, but there was a statement of the defendant that he had been to prison, he had done prison time. I mean, that's the mistrial component of it. You're going to the fact that that was intentional conduct. I believe, I think if you read this, and you read the prosecutor's explanation of why he said it, I don't think, I think that it flies in the face of what the prosecutor was, both counsel were instructed to do. Don't talk about it. 
And, and it's not a question. It's a statement. He comes right out and says, we heard portions, we heard portion that, that, that he had done some prior prison time. I, I think it's prosecutorial misconduct. I think the court was clear. You don't talk about it. And I think that when you ask, it's not even a question. Then you come out and you make the statement to spread in front of the jury that, listen, this guy's been to prison before for a significant period of time. I, I think that taints the jury. I think it's inappropriate. And I think a mistrial should have been granted at that point in time in order to, to, to clean things up and give uh, Mr. Rhodes a fair trial. I think... I believe that that, um, that it's prejudicial. It's certainly not probative, and I think that the impact of that, that that's the problem. You know, you, in some respects, you've got to show there's material prejudice, and I'm not real sure how you would ever do that, but it did go to a substantial right, and that's the fact that the prosecutor made a statement in front of the jury that the client had done prison time, and it's not even coupled with a question. Fortunately, there was an objection right away, but it, was a, it wasn't a question. I, I just ask you, I think you, page 77, page 78 and 79, uh, and, and, and uh, page uh, 80 forms the basis for, for the appeal. I think that the, the court, I, I appreciate your time uh, looking at this. I, 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 think, I believe it's pretty clear when you take a look at the, the transcript as relates to uh, the motion limine, including uh, it's uh, the beginning of the transcript is where the court discusses the issue of the motion limine and why the court ultimately didn't grant it. But I think it's relatively clear. Thank you for the time. Uh, good luck. I'm sure we'll see you around, see you around somewhere. Huh? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentations today. The court will take the matter under advisement. We will issue a written decision, which will be mailed to all parties to this appeal as well as posted on the last